Hi folks, good to be with you. We're excited to continue in our series in 1 Thessalonians in just a couple moments. I'm gonna read that for us from the scriptures as Rick Watts is gonna be sharing with us today. Before we do that, let me share a couple pieces of church life with you. First of all, this weekend, our teenagers are our way. It's something called a youth getaway. So what we'd invite you to do is take a moment to pray for the teenagers in our community that are at that event, that they would sense uh, the life and the love of Jesus and that they would build community together and that this would be a fortifying and, and significant moment in the life of our our teenagers and uh, just pray a blessing for them if you think about them this weekend. Hey, our women's worship night is coming up on May 8th. There's more information on our website. Ladies, take a look at that. We also want to remind you that the Holy Spirit Through the Arts art exhibit is coming up later in May and the final call for submissions is soon. So artists, you'll find more information on our website about that. Coming up on May 6th is a grow session with Rick Watts, how to read the Bible, Paul's writings. And so if you want to learn more about that, you can find a registration on our website. Join us on that Monday night at the building at Living Waters. We'd love to host you as we take some more time to understand what Paul is saying and how to read it uh, through, through the scriptures. As we speak about that, we're in uh, week two of our series in 1 Thessalonians, Hope and holiness. Uh, I kicked that off la last week. Rick is continuing now uh, looking at verses uh, 4 through 10. Allow me to read those for us and then Rick, uh, Rick will share. Goes this way. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Here's Rick to share with us now. Hi folks, I trust you're all doing well. Today we are continuing our series in First Thessalonians. As Luke so masterfully explained last week, thank you so much, good brother, not only is it likely our earliest Christian document, but it's also our first evidence of what it meant for non-Jews in Europe to become followers of Jesus. What did they face? And what were the primary issues with which they had to deal? Threatened by mob violence, Paul and Silas had to leave in a hurry, arriving first in Athens, then Corinth. Paul tried to return several times, but as he explains in chapter 2, verses 17 to 18, Satan hindered him. What he meant by that will have to wait. But it is precisely because of that hindrance that we have these marvellous insights. What could have been Paul's spoken word only to them is now a written word to all believers everywhere and throughout history. Unable to wait any longer, Paul sends Timothy, who returns to Corinth, with the good news of their steadfast endurance. And that's what occasions this letter. Paul's letters follow the standard first century pattern, but they are considerably longer. The some 14,000 papyrus letters that we have average 87 words, rarely exceeding 200. First Thessalonians is just short of 1,500. Loquacious authors such as Cicero or Seneca max out at around 2,500 and 4,100 respectively. Paul's 1 Corinthians has 6,800 and his Romans 7,100 words. That's remarkable. And why? Because it points to the strong literary character of the early Christian communities. But that's hardly unexpected given the unique scriptural heritage of Israel. Three things stand out. Teaching through writing mattered a great deal to Paul. Second, none of it is flummery, and some of it, as Peter later states, is difficult to understand. Preachers often contrast head knowledge with the heart. 
It's not always clear what they mean, but the former is clearly bad. However, for the spirit who inspired Paul, being spiritual and thinking hard go hand in hand. Finally, the form Paul chooses is vastly different from that of antiquity's public education. He writes letters. Why? Because their recipients are part of God's new family. Deeply personal letters, not abstract treatises, are the stuff of family communication. Since there was no mail service, letters needed letter carriers. These folks would be present during the discussion and editing as the letter was being written. As a result, when they read the letter to the gathered recipients, they could explain any tricky bits. It's brilliant, eh? Alas, today you'll have to make do with me, and I wasn't there. After the standard opening self-identification, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, there comes the addressees, followed by what will become the classic Pauline greeting. Grace to you and peace. Paul feels no need to invent a special spiritual style of writing. Just like Jesus' incarnation, God can speak just fine in the ordinary, everyday letter. But like a Christian King Midas, everything Paul touches turns to gospel. This is not just any greeting. It is profoundly grounded in what God has done through Jesus to give them genuine peace. God's gracious work in the Lord Jesus and the ordinary stuff of living in his world go happily hand in hand. And of course, they're all his. This is a great foundation and one from which we should always start. Our present lives in this world are now encompassed by God's grace and peace. Typically, the greeting is followed by a prayer, wish, or thanksgiving, and this is exactly what we meet in verse 2's, we give thanks. And here again, King Midas Paul transforms this far beyond the customary form. Now, I do apologize for briefly expanding on some of Luke's points, but they're important for our passage this morning. First, embodying his own closing directive in chapter 5, verse 18, that is, in all circumstances give thanks, Paul begins with his always giving thanks, and for all of them, including those whose lives leave something to be desired. It's a wonderful attitude, but that's exactly what grace means for him. Notice, too, that his thanksgiving is to God. This keeps everything in its correct and dependent perspective. Ultimately, this is God's gift, not Paul's nor theirs. And he actually tells those for whom he is praying that he constantly give thanks for them. That's not only a great encouragement, even more grace, but it's an example that we too might want to follow. Don't be afraid to tell folks that you are grateful to God for them. So what's Paul thankful for? His constant remembrance, as Luke noted, concerns the three pillars of the spirit-filled Christian life. First, their good works, born of a genuine trust in God. Second, this includes their now labouring with their own hands, born of a love of God and one another. This will come up later in chapter 4 and then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Finally, and in the midst of their present suffering, he remembers their steadfast endurance inspired by their sure and certain hope of their final glory. That hope is sure, but they need to stay the course. Trust, love, and hope reappear regularly in Paul's writings and famously in 1 Corinthians 13. And might I suggest they should likewise appear regularly in our lives. And he says this knowing full well that some will need firm correction in precisely these areas. That's great grace again. And finally, everything is in the context of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning, as we've seen in Luke's gospel, the Yahweh of the Shema, through whom they now know God as Father. They don't know God independent of the Lord Jesus, and neither do we. Now, the reason I've spent some time here is because many English translations have verse 4, the beginning of our text this morning, as a new sentence. But there's a strong case to be made that Paul is still giving thanks, all the way to verse 10. That's almost as long as their longest everyday letter. 
In verse 10, then, Paul moves on from giving thanks for what he remembers to giving thanks for what he knows in the present. That you, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, have been chosen by God. Alongside the city, family was the other main pillar of ancient society. Without a family, you're in serious trouble and at grave risk. So all kinds of people would join themselves to the household of a powerful and influential patron. Paul's brothers and sisters marks a seismic change for the Thessalonian believers. They are now part of a new family, a new household, and their patron is God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. For the first time in human history, a new institution completely independent of the old was growing up within and alongside it. This language goes back a long way. In Exodus 2.11, Moses' brothers are actually his fellow Israelites, and it occurs frequently thereafter in Scripture. Now, unfortunately, in trying to capture this larger collective, most English translations go for people, as in Moses' people. And that's okay, but it badly misses the power of the metaphor. Being someone's brother or sister is far more intimate and freighted with mutual obligation. This shift goes back to Jesus. As we saw some time ago in Luke chapter 8, when told that his mother and brothers stood outside, Jesus replied, My mother and my brothers are those who hear and do the word of God, that is, those who listen to and obey him. That's a staggering realignment. And I'm not sure many of us have fully grasped just how radical it is. Following Jesus is not about traditional conservative values where my immediate family is the center of my identity, trumping pretty much every other obligation. According to Jesus, we cannot continue to do that and be his followers. Our family is much bigger. Look around the room. These are now our mothers and brothers and sisters. And that's not counting all the gathered communities of believers in the rest of Fort Langley, let alone beyond. Imagine if we started to take that seriously. Perhaps we might find that this riveting news, as with the Thessalonians, would also spread like wildfire. Second, as part of God's new family, they are beloved. This too is remarkable. For Aristotle, such a relationship with the gods was inconceivable. They were all about power, and the disparity in power was just too great. But that's not our unique God. Aristotle had never encountered the compassionate and merciful Lord of the Exodus, let alone the Lord Jesus, about whom we've been hearing in Luke. Historically, beloved of God applied exclusively to Israel. The rest of us stood outside. But in the Lord Jesus, even non-Jews are now included. A former colleague of mine once remarked that he didn't know of a single Pauline theology that focused on, let alone began with, Paul's deep devotion to and love for Jesus, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. But for Paul, the fundamental grammar of our existence is that we are a new family beloved by God. And maybe that's what those pastors meant by head knowledge, thinking but outside God's familial love. Well, this brings us to our third and rather tricky bit. Although the English translation has God has chosen you, what Paul actually knows is your election. Now, the idea of election has a longer contentious history, raising questions about God's sovereignty, free will and predestination. That is, God either chooses you or not. And once saved, always saved. If you're chosen, you can never be unchosen. We've touched on this before, but it's important to put election in its proper context. Given the Exodus origins of brothers and sisters, we should start there. Now, it's true that God's deliverance of his people was God's project and that he chose Israel, sorry, not Canada, though emphatically not because of their greatness. In that sense, God's purpose in predestining his creation for renewal through Israel comes before anything we do. But it's also true that when God fulfilled his promises, a mixed multitude, not of Abrahamic descent and of their own free will, 
joined elect Israel in their exodus. And it's equally, if sadly true, that numbers of this elect Israel and that mixed multitude died in the wilderness because of their disobedience. Of course, God does not nor ever will break his promises, even if many of them, and perhaps us, did and do. Paul's point then is not that God has chosen some and not others. He's talking about what it now means for them to have joined God's family. In spite of all the hostility and persecution that they, as a small and alienated community, now face, God will keep his promises. They will escape the wrath that is to come and will instead attain future glory. Now, Paul has already mentioned one of the reasons they are members of God's beloved and elect people. It was those three pillars of their spirit-filled Christian life. This, if you like, is the Pauline version of James. You say you trust God, show me your trust by your works. Or as with Jesus, a good tree brings forth good fruit. The sure evidence remaining in God's love is trust, hope, and care. If they're not present, we might well wonder, regardless of whether we attend church on a Sunday or not. But that's not all. Paul also knows how the gospel first came to them, not in word only, but in power, even in the Holy Spirit and with full persuasion. Now, as Luke mentioned last week, there were lots of folks peddling all kinds of words with all kinds of ulterior motives. Twittering influencers, you see, who want your money are not so new. But as Paul will remind them in chapter 2, he, Silas, and Timothy are not those kinds of people. And why? Because their word came in power and the Thessalonians' transformed lives testify to that fact. This is another truly remarkable moment. These folks know all about skillful presentation and winsome persuasion. Indeed, Paul himself regularly debated, regularly debated and argued in order to prove the truth of the gospel. But his emphasis here is instead on their own personal experience. He knows they are elect because they experienced this word in power, yea, verily, even of God's Holy Spirit and the full conviction he brings. But what does Paul mean by full conviction? Unfortunately, it's not immediately clear. It could refer to the impressive signs and wonders that Paul, when defending himself, associates with being an apostle. But given that Paul later defends himself in chapter 2, it's odd that he doesn't specifically mention them here. It could also mean the full conviction with which Paul, Silas, and Timothy spoke. That is, the conviction that their gospel came from God. Or finally, it could mean the response of the Thessalonian believers. The Holy Spirit's power was evident in their being fully persuaded. Since Paul doesn't expand, it could well be, and I think very likely is, a combination of all three. It's hard to see one being at work without the others. Several vital points emerge. It's immediately clear that Paul is not promoting himself, and neither should we. Brothers and sisters, be very, very wary of those preachers who do. Paul's focus is on the Word and especially the attendant Holy Spirit's convincing power. It's something we should never forget. This power is what marks out our proclamation from all the other noise. It's what Pentecostals have understood from the beginning when, for us, being baptized in the Spirit was about mission and proclamation. I remember years ago sitting in Gordon Fee's biblical interpretation class. It was by far the toughest but most informative I'd taken. I'd never worked so hard. It was the last day all of our assignments were in and Gordon began to talk about his own journey. He spoke of the amazing day he realized he didn't have to choose between being a scholar and being on fire. He could be both. And then he challenged us. Friends, all you've learned this semester is vital if you are going to handle the Word of God with all the care and respect it deserves. But, he said, 
If you're not prepared to spend all Saturday night on your face in your study until you hear from God, he then strode to the door and flung it open. Leave now. The church does not need you. Oh, my goodness. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. Paul does not play off word against a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit, and neither should we. It's a tragedy that so many Christians, their denominations and seminaries, opt to emphasize one often against the other. And we can already see what we tend toward. At the end of the letter, Paul will have to admonish the Thessalonians not to stifle the Spirit, particularly through prophecy. And this church is barely months old. If it was a danger for them, how much more for us? One final observation. This is the Holy Spirit. The convincing power is all about conforming us to the image of our holy God. This is not about me being set free to do my own thing. It wasn't with the Exodus, and it's not with the gospel. And that's what much of the rest of the letter is about. What does it mean to be part of a holy God's family? Now, Paul has no need to explain what that gospel was. After all, they heard it. But for us, at the very least, it focused on the Lord Jesus Christ crucified. According to 1 Corinthians, folly to speculative Greeks and weakness to opposing Jews, but now gloriously resurrected. To this, we could add those things which Paul says they already know throughout the letter. His preaching is recorded in Acts and the kinds of things we get in Luke's gospel, Paul's close companion. Now, at this point, Paul introduces a fascinating aside. We know all this, he says, just as you know what kinds of people we were for your sake. Why is this here? Because the lives that Paul, Silas, and Timothy lived out for the sake of the Thessalonians were entirely in keeping with the word they preached. He'll develop this later. But for now, it's a stark reminder to me that what I say about Jesus' actions on our behalf needs to be reflected in how I live for the sakes of all you who hear. And if that's not happening, I might well ask myself if I'm taking the Lord's name in vain. Not only that, it's precisely those transparently lived lives which led to the second reason Paul knows that they are God's beloved elect. You, he says, became imitators of us and of the Lord receiving the word in much tribulation and with joy in the Holy Spirit. Again, to use James' language, they're not only hearers of the word, but doers. So what did the Thessalonians imitate? They received the spirit-empowered and convicting word in spite of much persecution and with joy. To be honest, I don't actually find suffering very appealing. I'd much rather not, and I suspect I'm not alone. But for Paul, it's part and parcel of discipleship. In fact, not much further on in chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, he'll remind them that they already know suffering is their destiny. And of course, as we've seen in Luke, it's what Jesus faced and the path he required of all his disciples. When later writing to the Romans, Paul even says that they should boast in their sufferings. It's not because they're masochists but because it's the mark of a genuine discipleship, producing an endurance that leads to character and hope in the Spirit through hearts filled with the love of God. Folks, our new loyalties will create opposition. And of course, how else will they change the world? Get used to it. But this is neither some stoic stiff upper lip nor the angry, grim, accusatory protest that dehumanizes anyone else who disagrees, mercilessly sacrificing them on the altars of our superiority. Radically different, this living against the grain is marked, as we've seen, by grace and peace. Then, trust, hope, and care. And now we learn also by joy. Just as Christian hope was radically different from that of the surrounding culture, so too Christian joy. In Roman street comedy, which could be breathtakingly pornographic, joy was most often associated with sex and food. That sound familiar? But it was fleeting and quickly replaced by anxiety. 
People often took joy in the wrong things. For example, a man who had just raped the object of his lust. Nor did they respond well to others' joys. For the tiny minority of elite male philosophers, it concerned mainly self-directed virtuous activities, especially as they related to my growing to accept that death was the natural end of humans. Christian joy is very different. It is neither a, about self-directed acceptance of death nor fleetingly competitive about food or sex. It comes from belonging to a loving and faithful God's elect, brothers and sisters in his new family, in the Holy Spirit, and in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection life of the world to come. This, I think, explains characteristically Pentecostal worship and why it is such a feature of our gatherings. This same Holy Spirit, powerful in conviction and in transforming our lives, also brings great joy. We've already seen that in Luke's Gospel, especially with his unique emphasis on the Spirit. In Galatians, Paul places joy second among the Spirit's fruits. Joyful worship should indeed be a mark of our lives together. No wonder Paul concludes his letter, always rejoice. We really can, and for reasons that only come through Jesus. Even if they kill us, we still win. But there's more. The Thessalonians are not just imitators. These evidences of their election means that they have become models to all who believe, not only in the province of Macedonia, but also in the southern province of Achaia. How so? Well, remember Luke's map? They are on the major highway crossing Macedonia, and their famous port links them to the south. They might not have realised it, but they are now examples to all of those who believe in the region. Apparently, what happened in the Thessalonian synagogue and the uproar that followed has spread like wildfire throughout other Jewish synagogues in the region. As a result, the word of the Lord and their trust in God has sounded out like a herald's clarion proclamation way beyond Macedonia. It's even gone out into Asia, modern Turkey, and indeed everywhere. So much so, Paul says, that he has no need to mention it. Wow, how enormous is that? How encouraging. The response of this little beleaguered and suffering group has itself started to turn the world upside down. And what is that hot news? It's how they responded to Paul's gospel and how they turn from idols to serve the living and true God. This might not seem much to us, but the anxious ancient world was awash with fickle deities who, according to Herodotus, were full of jealousy and delighted in throwing human affairs into confusion. Nothing significant was done without sacrificing to appease them. It's a clear testimony to the gospel's transforming power that they've completely disappeared from our culture. Instead, the Thessalonians now await the return of the resurrected Jesus, who has delivered us from the coming wrath. Two quick points here. The end is not yet. That's why endurance really does matter. Jesus himself taught the same thing. We need to stay the course. Second, as much as we might like to avoid it, a holy God's coming wrath is as real as the damage our selfishness and greed does to other people and to his creation. Jesus warned of the life and death seriousness of our decision. Be smart, folks. Choose life. Well, my time has gone, but one last word. Paul gives thanks because in spite of all the difficulties, this small, alienated and persecuted community of new believers faced, God has not only filled them with the Spirit's joy, but their turning to serve the living and true God has now become the talk of the region and beyond. Dear friends, do be encouraged. We have no idea how many lives might be touched by our Spirit-inspired, joy-filled and transformed faithfulness, even in what seems like very difficult times. Grace and peace be upon us all. In the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, thanks to Rick from that uh, wonderful teaching. Let's take a moment as we close to pray for ourselves as we go into this week and to pray for the teenagers that I mentioned off the top who are away at a, a significant weekend of retreat for them. Let's, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of life we have through you. We pray that we would know your life all through this next week. Would you help us as we face challenging things? Would you give us confidence in you? Would you bring us close together with other believers and remind us of the hope that we have in you? Lord, we pray for our teenagers and ask that they would meet you powerfully this weekend, that you would do deep and meaningful things in their hearts. You draw them close to you and close to each other in community. We pray a blessing on them. We pray for our wider world as we look out and ask for your life, love, and peace to ring out through our church and through Christian communities worldwide, bringing hope where it looks like things are hopeless. We trust you, Jesus. We put our lives in your hands as we go into this new week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you and have a great week.